So today, obviously, we're talking about colour, and um, hopefully, we're going to um, expose a, a, a couple of um, turning points in, in colour in architecture, things that have, have sparked uh, new developments and, and changing in trends. And uh, I'd maybe like to, to start off with um, going right back to the origins, uh, because of course the colour of, of, of old buildings uh, was never actually really a design issue, was it? Maybe I can ask this Bar with you, Barry. Um, you know, we, we all know that uh, you know cities like Siena and the colour that's now named after the city. I mean, it wasn't design, was it? It's just a, a natural byproduct of where the city was, the colour. Yeah. Well, and, and I think going back further than that, a lot of people. Uh, probably don't realize that the pediments of the Greek temples were in fact fairly vividly colored um, and, and everybody assumes that that was that pristine white architecture but in fact color goes back in, in architecture it goes back to the early origins of buildings and then uh, I think that that's sometimes lost in, in the modernist movement that, that color goes way back and was always important in the built environment. Looking at the, the buildings in the UK I mean a lot of the <laughs> the building in, in the Victorian era, I mean, is 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 kind of typified by by red brick and 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 uh, and, and, and tiled roofs from the clay that's around the cities. Uh, and and those buildings from a non-architect, I mean, just kind of look right. I mean, that that, that that's that's obviously so. Is it is that just because we're used to seeing those, or are there maybe so? Are there are there some rights and wrongs about colour in buildings and the? Um, no, I think there's no rights and wrongs. I think that's. I think that's where we are. I think that when you when you look at a brick building, I don't think you see color, you see a material. And I think that's really a huge difference because you don't react to a material the same way as you do to a added color on the surface. Yeah. To pick up on your point about the origins of color going way back, I mean that was probably. I mean you were talking about kind of palaces and, I, but but the, the conventional houses probably. Yeah, the, the, the majority of buildings were, were just mm -hmm. kind of in, indigenous materials where they like slates in Wales and when they, I mean that, it, it was only the, the kind of higher budget buildings maybe that they could use these, would that be, would that be? I assume that would be the case but actually when you think about it if you travel around Italy you see and maybe, I'm not sure what the demographics were for having a villa but you see lots of uh, um, uh, tile floors that are very vivid, mosaic floors uh, associated with a villa, so at, at some point you do realize that in a domestic application that, that they would have had a very vivid floor, um, which is kind of interesting. I'm, I'm not sure yeah. what the walls would have been, but yeah. But it, it is true. Uh, if you look way back when people started to paint the house, that was because they could afford to. Yeah. And that's where it started. Yeah. I guess in the same way that people use rose colors in paintings because they were those materials and paints were available to them. So, um, so you said earlier on that there were, there were no rights and wrongs. I mean, it, it, but it isn't the, what, what Barry touched on earlier about it being subjective, like, I might not like red. I mean, how, how, how do you deal with that? That you might produce a building that people, some people just don't like. I mean, you might put off some, you know, residents from buying a building because they don't like the green. I mean, is that, is that how, do, how do you deal with that? Well, actually, I mean, I did a, a, a colour piece on the interior of a city academy in Nottingham, and it was a, a gradation of colours that sat above the, the top of classrooms, but you read it as a gradation that went all the way down one side and up the other side in a, in a um, straight line. And it was interesting that some children were like, well, I, that, that's got makeup of it. I don't want to go in that classroom. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult line to tread. I think you have to also have to be aware of that if you live in a building that has color on the outside, you don't see it. I mean, you're in, you're inside, you're in the house. So it's when you walk home or leave that you can't see it. I, would you really say, oh, I don't want to live here because this building is green and I see it two minutes a day? I mean, if, you, if it's your personal residential living, yes, I would not paint it in a color I don't like. But in a, in a bigger building, I don't think you would. I don't think you would. I, well, I hope not, because interestingly, in kind of East London, there's an outbreak of, of, uh, of housing mm -hmm. that is in very, uh, around the Olympic site, there's a, and uh, that area of, I guess, Tottenham, there's a number of new schemes coming up that are, 
have very bold use of colors. And, and it's kind of funny because some you look at and go, oh, I kind of like that. And others you look at, and I, I'm not sure I would say I would live there, but I would say that. <laughs> wouldn't be the first place no. I would <laughs> choose the chat. So, so Pei, you said earlier that there was a, 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 an increase in the sound of pigments. What, can, you, can you derive any trends from that? Are, are there certain colors that are, are, are more? Well, the trend that you can derive is that people are using more color. In, inside and outside of their houses, and architects are specifying more color. It is not a huge increase at all, but it is clearly on sales. I mean, we sell, you, you buy the base and you get it tinted so we can measure how much pigment you, you sold. And it is rising. So, Barry, maybe you, you could tell us a little bit about the design process. We, we, we questioned earlier about who, who came up with the, the concept for Central St. John's, you know, what was it, was it, was it, was it the client? So, when, when you're sort of walking through your office and you're seeing these, the, the, these themes, I mean, do, do you say, well, you know, what about adding some colour to this? I mean, how, or, 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 how Only if you're desperate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, it, clearly, I think it varies by designers. And part of, you know, we were a big firm, and part of the reason I sit on this, uh, this in, involved in this discussion right now is they said, okay, they, they've asked for somebody who's, who's interested in color. Oh, you, you're, you're not afraid of color. Whereas we have some guys who are clearly absolutely afraid of, of, of color. Um, but I, I, I think that it varies by the project. Um, it, a lot of my stuff is, is mixed use, and I think, you know, when you were talking about public versus private buildings and sort of commercial corporate architecture versus commercial architecture, like uh, retail architecture, there, you know, the color, the use of color is a lot more considered. And one, one of the, just, I think, probably the, an interesting process to describe is we, we were working, we were working on Gatwick Airport, and uh, it's just a mess. Uh, and so we, we, we said, okay, first of all, you want to clean it up. You want to knock everything back. And the wayfinding has a, it's now a black and yellow color scheme because that's the internationally uh, most easy to read color scheme. So you've got all these signs that are black and yellow. Well, that's probably not the most friendly color unless you're a goth to start painting things. And so you, the color has been established. And then you say, well, what kind of works with that? And you get out your color wheel and you, you start saying, okay, red. Well, now what, what's interesting there is uh, if you use red, easy jet objects because they're, well, it's that, that favorite orange thing again. So you, you eliminate all these colors because they're on brand for certain airline users, but not on brand for other airline users. And at the end of the day, that's in a way a personification of any conversation you would have about color amongst individuals. Or, or amongst companies or amongst buildings. And so you end up defaulting to uh, um, sort of muted tones, natural tones, or neutrals because nobody can argue with those. When you started out wanting to actually use colors just to create an, uh, an environment that, was, that could exist, that could make a statement not in opposition to, but an equally strong to this wayfinding stuff that is paramount to the airport. And then looking forward, there, there, um, there are a number of kind of uh, lighting technologies coming with illuminated facades uh, that are actually providing the opportunity to have changing colours. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, is this is this something we want, or is this? Well, is this... does it matter if you want it or not? I think the, the the important thing is that it is happening, and I think what is interesting to look at, I think, is that it's not reflected light. So it's not light shining on a building, it's, it's a building emitting light. You know, it's light you know, embedded in, inside, shining out. And what you can do with that, because reflecting light is one thing, but if you have lights inside, and you can, you can do almost anything. And I think that it's, it's like with everything else. When something is new, you want to use it. So you, know, you get an invention of some kind. So you can have color light shining out of a building, great, let's do that. And you will see that for a while, and then we'll say, okay, enough of this. Yeah. It's interesting, because we, uh, we interviewed uh, Philip Tilly, the, the chairman of Arab, when he came in, and we said, I asked him for what one word that would, would, would most affect architects in the next 10 years, and he said, facades, and that was it. And it's interesting that that um, is, is perceived as, you know, it is, it's, it's an evolving technology, but there's so many new developments coming in. I, I, I thought you were going to say LED because you know, well, I mean, if that, the actual light fixtures are changing the quality of lights in a room and that the big LED screens, uh, 
I, I, it started out in jest, but now I'm trying to get somebody to, to allow us to do it. Is I, I think the ultimate high street store is just a giant video screen, an edge to edge TV like the one I had at home, but I just changed the facade with every season, and I don't actually mess around with window displays. I just have the fashion show from the, you know, going on constantly, and at the end of the day, you, that's a, an arguably a timeless building because it's constantly moving with the times. Um, it, it's a first class gadget, but it has yet to be done in that kind of level of purity, if you will. And I, somebody will do it, and, and like you said, it'll be, well, that's cool, and then, like, your reaction to Salvador Tiger. But there also, I mean, they, so we have all these movement and stuff, and then you go to Athens, and you look at the, the uh, uh, now, so, pop out of my hand, it is called the... Parthenon? Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Parthenon, and, and you like it because it's still. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's stable, still, serenity. There is no movement or lights. Well, there is lights in the evening, but... It, and, and you really appreciate that, so... Okay, well, well, well thank you. I think we've got, Barry's just given us a glimpse of the future. Yeah, we've um, covered some interesting territory. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.